And uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, this is a great culture. The, with the food, the, the music and the food we, we, we eat that you don't find nowhere else on the planet. Music is so much a part of the fabric of our society because originally it's a very tough place to live. You have to work really hard. And to compensate for that in your life, then you played really hard. And what goes with playing is some kind of music, is some kind of expression. It's kind of letting the pop-off valve go. And, uh, and I think that quality uh, just completely encompasses all generations, from the youngest to the oldest. It doesn't matter. You can sing, you can have a party, you can dance, you can play, you can tell stories. That's all part of our culture. And I think it's, it, it's definitely inherent in most families around here. My greatest experiences are the, the place that I would love to play most has always been here in New Orleans because it, was, it had always been a challenge to try and come up with something new to, to throw at these young dancers that would show up that they were not ready for. And they, they sort of brought something new by the way of dance every week for us to try and top. The music of Louisiana has its roots in the varied cultural traditions brought here by a myriad of immigrants. Claimed by the Spanish in the late 1500s and later ruled by the French, Louisiana's music is a conglomeration of the traditions brought here by the early settlers and slaves. By the 1700s, Louisiana's culture, music, and food began to show the influence of the Caribbean and the French West Indies as whites, Creoles, and blacks brought their rhythms, their cuisine, religious beliefs and practices to Louisiana. And these cultural forces helped shape an indigenous and varied musical legacy that's had a significant and lasting impact on the music of America and the world. On April 3rd, 1948 in Shreveport, Louisiana, the now famous radio show Louisiana Hayride made its inaugural broadcast and quickly became one of America's most listened to music shows. The Louisiana Hayride was carried nationwide by CBS Radio, and it was labeled the cradle of the stars, which enabled regional artists to cross over into mainstream popular culture. Along with Louisiana's country, gospel, and Cajun performers, the Hayride also showcased performers such as Johnny Harton, Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, and Hank Williams. The Hayride also made Hank Williams a country star. While he was hosting the show, he became a fan of the music of Acadiana, and in tribute, he borrowed heavily from the Cajun song Grand Texas when he recorded his hit, Jambalaya. At the time of the Hayride's debut in 1948, no one knew that a mere 120 miles away in the town of Faraday, Louisiana, a young musician named Jerry Lee Lewis would join Elvis Presley and Fats Domino in helping to create rock and roll. As a teenager, Jerry would sneak into black dance halls and listen to the blues. Then his father introduced him to country music. Lewis had a slow start in making his name, but eventually he did find a job playing piano performing classic country and western songs made popular by Hank Williams. Jerry Lee Lewis's music was about to explode onto the American pop culture scene as rock and roll. With a sound that was born out of blues, jazz, gospel, folk, and country, all of which are part of Louisiana's unique cultural heritage. Oh, the shit. Oh, you're fine. So kind. 
Jerry's hometown of Faraday sits close to the border of Louisiana and Mississippi, which made it easier for the young musician to be exposed to both Delta blues and to gospel music being performed in the tents and churches across the South. Gospel's contribution to rock and roll includes the rhythmic beat, drama, and the tension between the audience and performer that's rooted in the church. Like an old-fashioned gospel tent revival and reminiscent of an evangelical preacher, New Orleanian Raymond Miles leads his performers and audience to sing, clap, dance, and receive the Holy Spirit through the music's message of the power of the Lord. Gospel Music's foundation can be found in the early folk music of the Africans living in the Deep South. They had a deep-rooted belief in the power of faith and relied upon spirituality to help overcome the injustices of slavery. This spirituality helped give birth to black gospel music, and black churches became a key component of black social and political life. By the early 1930s, churches began featuring gospel bands, utilizing keyboards, drummers, and guitar players, inspiring congregations to sing the praises of the Lord. Many of the early black churches in the South were the classic little wooden church out in the country. No organ or piano, just a wood floor and wooden benches. Congregations sang traditional gospel songs accompanied only by the tapping of feet and the clapping of hands, resulting in a sound that transcended everyday life. There has always been a separation between sacred and secular music within the black community, and the preacher and the blues singer have been seen as the uh, sacred and secular spokespeople for their community. Uh, and many of the musicians, if not all of the musicians, blues and sacred singers, grow up as children in the church. And it is the blues singers who, as they say, cross over into the blues from church music. And many later will then go back to sacred music. One musician told me that the only difference is when you go from blues to sacred music, you take out my baby and you add my Lord and keep right on going because the two are very, very similar. Everybody, everybody, everybody.
blues was born out of hard times in the South and evolved into one of the most powerful musical forms in America. From its beginnings in the field hollers of slaves, blues has resonated throughout the development of American popular music. Somebody please write my mama Tell her to save me Tell her to pray for me I got the eight and I'm going down slow The black experience in the Deep South was one of poverty and oppression. The early musical expression of black Americans reflected the social and political conditions of slaves, sharecroppers, field workers, and laborers. I'm so poor and little The blues really is several levels of meaning. First of all, it's the voice of black history. It's a key not only to black music, not only blues, but gospel and R&B. It's also a key to black literature. But in a broader sense, the blues is also a key to modern music. No music could exist today without the blues. The blues have always been a vital part of Louisiana's musical heritage. Louisiana native John Campbell incorporated the tradition of acoustic blues with Chicago blues and melded them into powerful and spellbinding performances that exemplified the musical power that gave birth to modern day rock music. playing slide guitar up in Shreveport, Louisiana. I got my first guitar on Phantom Street. There was a great man, he came many years before me on Phantom Street, and he used to play in the piano houses down there. His name was Lead Belly. And he played what he called a piano style. Texas. Over there they played what they called a banjo style. Mississippi, I heard. All right, man. If you're going to do the slide boogie, you got to do three things. You got to pop. 
slap and slide. But you got to do it with a beat. The blues is a central part of the American South. I would argue it's the key to the rich legacy of African cultures that mixed with European and Native American experience to give us what we think of as Southern culture. It is the great sea of life. B.B. King said once that it's like the floor of the ocean where life first began. The Mississippi Delta is that floor to the blues. The blues began there and continue to flow from it. The blues is our greatest musical legacy. I think the music will always be a part of American culture. Get yourself on back home. The music of Southwest Louisiana has been influenced by rhythm and blues and Texas blues. Early Southwest Louisiana was a poor region made up of small towns. The main way of making a living was either cattle or rice farming. In the early 1900s, the discovery of oil fields in Texas and Southwest Louisiana created new job opportunities for Acadians. The music of Texas had a direct influence on the music of Acadiana as Cajun and Creole musicians drew inspiration from Texas blues and rhythm and blues. Grammy winner and internationally acclaimed musician Clarence Gatemouth Brown attributes his style of music to these influences. I'm raised on the Texas side Born in Louisiana I'm raised on the Texas side That makes me a dual citizen Louisiana is just a few feet apart. I love both of the planets. That's where I got my start. Cause I was born in Louisiana. And raised on the Texas side. I was raised in a town called Orange, Texas, on the border of Louisiana, and it's 12 miles from Fenton, Louisiana, say, where I was born. I'm part of both states, Texas and Louisiana, so naturally. I combine the both. See, it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, Louisiana people live in Orange, Texas, a whole lot of them. In fact, that town is loaded with them. All the way up almost to Houston. My musical roots here in Louisiana, since I live here, I try to dwell on my surroundings. Like I wrote a tune called Dangerous Critter because I saw an alligator swimming out in the back, in my backyard. And it come to me to write a song about him, and I did. And uh, Swamp Ghost, I wrote that by looking at the swamps out there. I wrote that here. And uh, then I'll do Texas stuff. But since I'm living here, I do a lot of Louisiana stuff. But of course, Texas got mad at me because this last album said, why don't you do something for your own state? I said, I am. She said, well, it's all Louisiana, so it's not really. But you have to listen a little harder. I classify my music as American and world music. I do play jazz, I, I play country, I play Cajun, I play bluegrass, I play Celt, I play 
you name it, I play all kind of music. He's a, a taste of um, classical, I play it all. I first incorporated, I listened to a lot of blues coming up, and it was so negative and heartbreaking. I said, I didn't want to play that sort of stuff. So I set myself up to be more of in the jazz, on the border of jazz and blues. More on a big band style, more orchestrated, rather than two notes all the way. Like I hear some of these guys, two notes and crying in his beard. And it's country music, it's the same way, you know? Uh, I kind of avoid all that stuff. Like I said, I play blues, but it's more of a sophisticated type of blues. Blues that'll teach your kid and my kid and everybody else's kid the right way of life rather than the wrong way. Even in the music, I can play music all day and never open my mouth to sing, but the music teaches as well as the voice. I play mandolin, mandola, fiddle, viola, guitar, harmonica, very little piano, and I was a drummer for five years, or longer, back in the early 30s. But most of all, I make my instrument sound like what it's not. See, my guitar sound like horns. I play horn lines. I do that with my fiddle, and I do that also with my viola. In towns such as Church Point, Mamou, Eunice, and Lafayette, Cajun and Zydeco songs reflect the dominant French influences of the area. The cultural traditions of Southwest Louisiana are also reflected in the work of the artisans and craftsmen of the region. Francis Pavi began painting as a child and draws inspiration from the land, the music, and the folklore of his beloved countryside. What's unique about where we live here is that there's a lot of different visual stimuli that influenced the way I look at things and see things. My artwork was uh, influenced by music. When I started making art, I was into the blues at the time and realized that our local, you know, Clifton Chenier was like our local blues hero. He was like, you know, incredible. And, and, and in going and seeing him, I realized he was even more than that. He wasn't just a blues guy. He was like the king of Zodiac. He was really a, uh, pioneer in, in a fusion of many different styles of music. And, um, and in turn, that led me to a lot of uh, appreciation of local, local culture and local, um, you know, my, my roots. Clifton Chenier is one of the founding fathers of the music known as Zydeco. Playing the accordion and singing in traditional French Creole, Chenier established himself as a dynamic stage performer. He paved the way for an entire generation of Zydeco performers and helped to make Zydeco an integral part of the American musical landscape. That music earned Clifton the title King of Zydeco. His son CJ carries on the tradition. Zydeco to me has always been, I've always described it as happy feet music. It's a mixture of blues and waltzes and boogie, 
two steps, you know, and it's always just something to make you happy, make your feet move, you know? When I'm on stage playing a car, you know, I'm thinking, uh, okay, man, let's get these people's feet moving. <laughs> let's make them happy. Let's play this thing and make them really feel where you're coming from. My accordion is uh, a Baldoni accordion. Uh, I like it with a musette tune, which has that little vibrato in it, which is the sound I really got from my dad, Tiffany Chanel. Well, my daddy came and got me out of Port Arthur, Texas when I was 20 years old. I said, come on, son, let's come on the road with me. <laughs> and that was my beginning, a saxophone player in a Zydeco band with Tiffany Chanel. It was back in the late 70s when I started playing with my daddy. It was a new experience to me. I had never seen anything like this before in life, and it's still fun. I like to be remembered as C.J. Chenier, the son of Cooper Chenier that really got up there and did all he could do to keep the music going. The basics for a Zydeco band, as defined by Clifton Chenier, were three instruments. Voice for the songs, piano accordion for the tune, and for percussion, an unusual instrument, the rub board, or foitois. A chance conversation between two music lovers, Clifton Chenier and Willie Landry, at the steel mill where they both worked, resulted in the creation of what the Smithsonian has designated as a unique American creation. Today, Mr. Landry's son, Tidon, continues to create the classic rub board. In 1947, uh, my father and Cl Clifton Chenier were working together at the refineries in Port Arthur, Texas. Clifton had the idea of making a rub board all in one piece, where it would hang over your shoulder. Because his brother Cleveland was playing one that you washed clothes with, and it had a rope hung on it, and he put that around his neck. Clifton was, um, he was an innovator. He, uh, he incorporated blues in his music. He incorporated rock and roll in his music. Uh, whatever he thought sounded good, that's what he would put in it. And, um, and Cleveland was an innovator as well with the rub board because he would mic his rub board. He would put different things on his rub board to make different sounds. He would play with the bottle openers where nobody else could figure out what he was doing. So they had a unique chemistry between them two. Louisiana is just, just like the rub board, it's unique. It's just a unique place, you know? I mean, you can't go anywhere in the world and find a place like Louisiana. And this area where Cajun and, and Zotico and Creole music is played, I mean, uh, people come here from all over the world just to hear our our music and eat our food. Let's get this thing
gonna move right here. I'm going, y'all. A French Creole, Stanley Dural, also known as Buckwheat Zydeco, resides outside the city of Lafayette, Louisiana, where his family has lived for generations. Both his father and grandfather were musicians, and they instilled in him a love of music and of the land, where raising animals, hunting, and fishing are ongoing traditions. Back, back here in Southwest Louisiana, uh, you have uh, uh, this is a great culture. The food, the music, and the dancing. And you have Cajun dancers, man, that can, can dance until tomorrow. Zodico dancers, gonna dance until next week. You have two nationality of people, a white nationality, a black nationality, speaking the same language. You know, playing the same instrument, two different styles of music from two different parts of the world. Now, that's amazing. You don't get no better than that. You, you, you get to Zydeco, man, uh, uh, please believe me, uh, you might play a song in 20 minutes, and, 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 and it's it hard to stop. You, you might get tired. You might sit down, and the song's still playing. You might get up again, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I use the expression, it's hard to stop doing what you're doing when you love what you're doing. The core originated here in uh, Southwest Louisiana. I heard it all my life because my dad played. You wake up, you <laughs> go to work, play accordion. Come home for lunch, playing the accordion. Come back home at night, playing the accordion. That was enough for me. I <laughs> that was a lot of accordion. And something that I, 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 I couldn't stand, you know. <laughs> I was a bad critic, man. I, I, was, I, was, I was a bad critic. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to hear nothing. I didn't want to hear, don't tell me nothing about no accordion. So, me and my dad didn't make it too good with my music, and I didn't make it too good with his music. Uh, and he told me one, one, he told me that I should be playing accordion like Clifton yeah, Chenier. Yeah. And Clifton Chenier came, came to the house, sat down, he spoke to me, asked me what I play organ in his band. And uh, I said, uh, okay, I said, I'll, I'll go play with him. But in my mind, I said uh, that I'll go this one night, Take my organ off the stage, put it back in my van. I said, now I played Zydeco music, and I still don't like it. <laughs> I got on stage with Clip and Chenier, and man, we got on stage, and this man come out with his accordion and got to stepping and playing. I've never seen, I said, I've never, I've never seen Clip and Chenier play. I'm just amazed to see see the energy that he, he projected. You see what I'm saying? And uh, then he says. Telling people good night. Anyway, I want you to say what I say. I'm wondering what, he, what he's talking about. You know, that's how much fun I was having. You know, that's the time went just so so fast. You know, man, I couldn't believe this. And that 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 one night I was supposed to play for, with him, and then don't play anymore. Uh, wound up staying with him over two years. And that was that was very inspirational. And uh, and me and my dad became buddies again. It's so hard to stop. <laughs> You say it's so hard to stop. You 
you know what make a uh, radical and and, uh, and and Cajun music uh, uh, like sorta of, sorta of, uh, relative? It, it's, it's, it's this the accordion. You see, you have accordion in Cajun band, you have accordion in, in radical band. That's what would bring the culture uh, closer together because by playing the same instrument, uh, you know, uh, 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 playing two different type of music. Master accordion makers in Louisiana, such as Junior Martin, have ensured that there will always be a source for this instrument that is at the heart of many of the bands of Acadiana. The accordion that we make, it's people refer to it as a squeeze box, accordion, a button box, all kind of names. But the real name of it is a melodeon. It's not, not an accordion, it's a melodeon. And the melodeon is a diatonic instrument. It's like a harmonica. You push in, you get one sound, and you pull out, you get another sound. This instrument is, is such a simple instrument that's so effective, and I think being that it plays four reeds at one time is what makes it such a good instrument. There's a lot of good accordion makers around now, and it, it's not easy to just listen to one accordion and say that this is a particular one's accordion, because the people around here are so good players that they can play anything and sound good, and you won't know whose accordion they're playing. If you're gonna learn how to play and you don't have a lot of talent, well, you're much better off with a Cajun accordion than you are trying to learn with a horner. But if you already play the accordion and you're a good player, then you can play anything. Louisiana's music has also been influenced by the cultural and musical traditions of the French immigrants who came down from Canada and Nova Scotia and who settled into Southwest Louisiana, now known as Acadiana. When the Acadians first got here, they didn't have any instruments. Basically, they brought their voice. Uh, they were known fiddle players in Akadi, so I have a feeling that once they got a hand on the fiddle around here, they continued to play stringed instruments as such. And then again, there was uh, numerous writers from France in the early 1800s who made it to Louisiana who would talk about the landscape of Louisiana and hearing uh, a twin fiddle sounds along the bayous that would be similar to what you would hear in the provinces of France. So we know by the 1830s, at least they were playing twin fiddles, this kind of style that we call Acadian fiddle playing. <laughs> I think the whole perspective of our group is to have fun and to be who you are. Our traditional music, the essence of it, was people expressing themselves. And I think that's what we've tried to do. And at the same time, you know, writing new songs and at the same time playing traditional songs or, or researching songs that have a certain theme. And I think that's been really great and kept us alive and, and kept us interested because our music was created when we played dances. And for us, it's been, I mean, we've had amazing success and people were looking for success. We weren't looking for anything. I think that's why it happened. And because of that, the idea that we did not have an agenda except to always remember where we learned this music and where this music came from. At the same time, it's like we call upon the spirits of people we've learned from, and, and that's us. So it's been, it's been a great trip. I'm 
sweep, viva somo para Jaye. On va jamais finir ce dance. On va jamais finir ce dance. La danse de la veille. For over 300 years, French-speaking Acadians and Creoles have loved and worked the land, primarily hunting, fishing, raising cattle, and farming sugarcane, rice, and corn. Fiercely proud of their heritage, this love of life and music continues today. In small towns across southwest Louisiana, the Cajun tradition of the Courir du Mardi Gras, also known as the Mardi Gras Run, is celebrated. Iota is the home of the annual Women's Courir, the colorful handmade costumes, such as the pointed hats and traditions which include clowning, begging, and mock flagellation, are remnants of French medieval customs brought to Louisiana by the Acadians. During the Courir du Mardi Gras, masked revelers travel on foot and horseback visiting houses in search of ingredients for a communal gumbo that's prepared at the end of the day. In exchange for these ingredients, the participants perform songs and dances, and they make a little mischief at each stop. A cappella singing has always been a part of the Acadian culture. In the town of Iota, this all-women's Mardi Gras group sing a French ballad, continuing another long-standing tradition of the Courir du Mardi Gras. Cajun music has basically been French ballads and Acadian fiddle tunes. I think that after World War II, uh, there was a big surge toward traditional Cajun music. There's certain stylistic things that make things the music Cajun. It's sort of a sharing of the older and the younger generation. It's a very family-oriented culture, and I think, you know, really often you find lots of the brothers and sisters and all the children will have houses on the property of the mother and father, and the grandparents will also live there. It's really great, everybody would just sort of be on the property together. And music was so, just in the house, all the instruments are lying around on the floors and, you know, and everything. Now, people would say, you know, you can't touch that, but they'd, all the kids would sneak in and play with the instruments and everything because uh, it's, it was not a really hands-off taboo thing. I mean, music is just so like a bloodline in this culture. It's just like the glue that holds the culture together. The music of Acadiana has been a major influence in the development of American music. Approximately 150 miles southeast of Acadiana, in Mandeville, Louisiana, 12-year-old Amanda Shaw fell in love with Cajun music while working on a fourth grade history project. She's helping carry on the traditions that were started hundreds of years ago. I started when I was four years old, and I actually started out classically when I was four. I actually had a Russian teacher, so he was very strict but I'm thankful for it and it has really helped me out. And when I was seven years old, I played with the Baton Rouge Symphony and I, I played a solo. And then when I was about eight, I started getting, I started hearing more of the Cajun music 
and I thought I really liked it because it was a dancing type music and it made people want to dance and sing and clap and you know just have a good time. When I was in fourth grade um, we had to do a project so I figured it'd be really cool if I could do Cajun history. And it was really neat because when I went through all of the books, just kind of reading up on it, and I got to learn different pieces from different eras of time. And um, it was really great because they have different eras, like they had the string band era, they had the accordion era, and each one of those is really different because like during the 40s, everybody, just the thing to do was to play a stringed instrument. And then a couple of years later, the thing to do was to play the accordion. And you know, it was really cool. Or in the beginning, all it was is just a barnyard party and somebody would bring their fiddle and, a, and some people would just bring, you know, just stuff to play on. And just, and it was just, really cool to see the different times and how it really went back and forth. Like, there are several different eras where the strings instruments were important and it was just really nice. And then once, you know, the electric stuff came along, everybody could plug in and just, but all the instruments made friends. About 200 miles southeast of Acadiana, New Orleans sits on the banks of the Mississippi River. Reflecting the diverse cultural makeup of Louisiana, no other city in America has a richer musical heritage. The New Orleans air is as thick as the music that's heard seven days a week. The sounds of blues, gospel, jazz, rhythm and blues, along with Latin-tinged grooves, echo from the streets of the French Quarter and from the shotgun houses and neighborhood music clubs that dot this steamy port city. Jazz was born on the streets of the black communities in New Orleans. Young musicians, typically using cast-off military horns, such as trumpets, trombones, and cornets, formed neighborhood marching brass bands. Some bands added drums, banjos, and other instruments, and incorporated the rhythms of ragtime and the blues. They performed at functions held by local social aid and pleasure clubs. These events included parades, neighborhood dance parties, and the classic New Orleans jazz funeral. Creole musician Lionel Ferbos has been playing jazz for over 70 years. He's played to audiences all over the world, performing the music that New Orleans gave birth to over 100 years ago. At the age of 91, Lionel now leads the Palm Court Jazz Band, entertaining jazz fans of all ages and from all corners of the world. Now you shake it, break it, hang it on the wall, throw it out the window, catch it when it falls, shim, she wobbles all night long. And I hear the same old song now, I'm going away. And I won't be back to fall. I'ma shake it, break it, hang it on the wall. 
Now I'm a shaking, breaking, hanging on the wall. Sold out the window, catching for its fall. She and she wobbled all night long. And I hear the same old song, huh? I'm going away, and I won't be back till fall. I'm a shaking, breaking, hanging on the wall. I'm up there, the first band up there. When we were young, we put the Starlight Serenaders. Then I went with the Moonlight Serenaders. And then I played with uh, whoever Larry's big band. And then I played with Captain Handy band and Walter Pichon's band. And then Laws Edgren with the Ragtime Orchestra, where we traveled all over Europe and everywhere. And then Palm Court. <laughs> What's really special about the playing with the Palm Court Band, it's knowing who you're working with. If you're familiar with the people that you work with, the ensemble parts go really well. Feeling because it's based more enough around to be jazz. Whereas all my life I played contemporary jazz. But traditional had that two beat thing, and if you can put some funk in there, you got something happening. Sounds for traditional jazz came from all over. The uh, obvious ones are gospel music, uh, street band music, uh, parade band music for funerals and things like that, and uh, blues, and also even back to minstrel songs and, and formal marches. But the biggest influence of all, I think, was probably ragtime. In the early 1900s, traditional jazz music was being heard in the dance halls, music clubs, and the streets of New Orleans. The brassy sounds of legendary figures such as cornetist Buddy Bolden, clarinetist Sidney Bechet, and trumpeter Joe King Oliver paved the way for generations of young black New Orleans second-line marching brass bands and both black and white ragtime and Dixieland jazz ensembles. One of the most important musicians of the 20th century is New Orleans' own Louis Armstrong, lovingly known as Satchmo. In his early teens, he would play and sing in church groups. By his late 20s, Armstrong had established himself as a genius of improvisation and stylistic invention. Armstrong's legacy is firmly established as a jazz master whose contributions to jazz and popular music have never been equaled. His revolutionary style of trumpet playing has impacted almost every traditional or brass band in New Orleans and the Western world. Today, now over a hundred years since his birth, the music of Louis Armstrong still resonates throughout the city. Here we go, y'all. On my feet. Can't tell me now. My feet. In 1977, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band appeared on the music scene of New Orleans. One of the oldest traditions in New Orleans music history, the brass marching band was about to have a new sound. Taking inspiration from their days as children watching and listening to neighborhood street bands, the musicians of the dozen were soon putting their own spin on second line marching and funeral processions. Gregory Davis reflects on the band's beginnings. He's been a member of the group for over two decades and is the current leader of the group. Since we had gotten to the, the, the habit of rehearsal, rehearsing and we didn't have uh, any gigs, we started bringing other music to the rehearsals, and that other music uh, started to be uh, stuff like uh, some Duke Ellington music or some Charlie Parker or some Miles Davis or some James Brown or uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, just whatever anybody wanted to bring to the rehearsal. We found a way to make it work with the instrumentation that we had, and then when we would get uh, an occasional gig, we try uh, some of the music out. I remember uh, one time we had a funeral 
to play. And then one of the songs that I had brought to the band was uh, Charlie Parker's uh, Bongo Beep. So we started playing that uh, and during the funeral procession, you know, during the second line part of the funeral, funeral procession. And um, I, I would be willing to bet that before that funeral parade, before that second line was over, we, pl we probably played Bongo Beep 12 to 15 times because, uh, you know, this was something that they wanted to hear. And so that sort of encouraged us as a group, as, as a unit, you know, as the Dirty Dozen, to keep adding new things uh, to the repertoire instead of just playing, a, you know, Bourbon Street Parade or when the Saints go marching in every night. Now, grew really out of the dancing in the second line that occurs here in New Orleans. Uh, probably if we were playing in New York or, uh, or Los Angeles or you know Memphis or, or, or in, in Paris or whatever, that probably would not have happened. That song probably would not have happened. Uh, the inspiration uh, for playing and the inspiration for that song was actually watching the, the people that were there at the club uh, dancing in front of us, and, and you know it was like they would. Uh, maybe do some dance step to sort of challenge us to try and play something else. You know, they do a few steps or whatever, and it was like, okay, top this. And that was the interaction that we had with the audience uh, throughout the whole time we, we played here, here in New Orleans. Uh, my greatest experiences are the, the place that I would love to play most has always been here in New Orleans because it, was, it had always been a challenge to try and come up with something uh, each week, we used to have this Monday night gig at the Glass House, and each week it was a challenge to come up with something new to, to throw at these young dancers that would show up. Uh, you know, they were called second liners, but they, 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 they termed it bug jumping. So each week it was a challenge to come up with something new that they were not ready for. And they, they sort of brought something new by the way of dance every week for us to try and top. We started uh, bringing other songs, whatever, you know, some New Orleans R&B, uh, so-called uh, soul music, or uh, uh, other types of jazz. We bring all that stuff to rehearsals. The challenge for us was to make this other music fit within the traditional New Orleans second line beat. And it's, uh, you would think that it's a, a, a simple thing to do, but because the New Orleans second line beat was a little bit different from the regular four on the floor, or the regular you know two and four thing that happens in most music and most jazz, uh, it was a little bit uh, interesting. It was a little bit difficult to try and make some modern jazz or some R and B fit to the traditional second line beat.
The influences of the Mardi Gras Indians have long been an integral part of New Orleans musical tradition. The chants, songs, rituals, and elaborate handmade costumes inspired by Native American Indian dress reflect the marriage of music and art in the African American community. The Mardi Gras Indian rhythms, along with the use of drums, cowbells, and tambourines, have impacted the music of traditional New Orleans brass bands and internationally known groups such as the Neville Brothers. This is part of the New Orleans heritage, a part of our culture. The Mardi Gras Indians. Indians coming from all over town. The Mardi Gras Indian thing is something that, as far as culture is concerned, is like uh, so much a part of uh, African American culture in New Orleans that Mardi Gras definitely wouldn't be Mardi Gras without Mardi Gras Indians. But uh, the, the thing about the sewing, the part of it that takes place, uh, that's, that's very spiritual. And the music and the art that goes with it is inseparable. The art and the music of the Mardi Gras Indians is inseparable. And that part of New Orleans culture is inseparable from the overall thing. New costumes are made each year, with each individual tribe distinguished by a different color, which changes every season. However, parts of the costumes, like the beaded panels, are recycled. And the making of these costumes requires substantial time and financial commitments on the part of the tribe members. Bo Dallas and Monk Boudreau have been members of Mardi Gras Indian tribes the majority of their lives. They now hold the titles of Big Chief, for their respective tribes, the Wild Magnolias and the Golden Eagles. Well, the uptown area and the downtown area, uh, the Mardi Gras Indians, they wear different styles of, of suit. Like downtown might wear something they call a mummy crown. They do a lot of secret work and a lot of uh, uh, pearls and mirrors and all different things like that. But uptown, and they did use beadwork, uh, rhinestone, and they don't use as much glue. Like, like the downtown Indians, most of their suit be, uh, they be sold, but they, they, they make the big crowns and they use a lot of marabou and a lot of uh, cardboard, cardboard uh, feathers, uh, turkey feathers and eagle feathers. But uptown Indians mostly use uh, ostrich plums. I sold my own costume and it's all hand sewed. I draw the Indian down first, and then I outline it with beads, which is white beads. Some of the guys outline them in black. It's just like coloring. Once you outline it, then you start filling in, and you have, you know, say 15 or 20 different color beads, and you just start beading in whichever color that you like, that's what you pick up, and you go from there. It means a lot to me because the time that we take and we put into it and the money that we spend on it, you know, you, you just couldn't imagine the feeling that you will have once you put it on. How important my costume is for me. My costume is one of the most important things that I know of right now. <laughs> because this is my, my life, it's my livelihood. Because uh, the only thing we ask for individual who want to participate in Manson in here to make a costume. Once he makes his costume, one of the early musical influences that was recorded in New Orleans, uh, one of the uh, influences of the musical influence of the Mardi Gras Indians was that rhythm, which is identified around the world as the New Orleans rhythm, or the, New Orleans, the, the New Orleans rhythm. Uh, and you know, it's also called second line and all the other stuff that the brass bands have that incorporated in what they do as well. And. Uh, it also influences the way I play the horn to some extent, too. I, use, I play rhythmically, and when I do, I like, those are the kind of natural rhythms that come out without thinking about it. He shoot the gun in the jailhouse door. without that flavor. This gumbo wouldn't be like it is without that flavor.
on the holiday. The traditions of Africa, the Caribbean islands, and the French West Indies have had a profound effect on the music, food, and religious practices of Louisiana. An unprecedented intermixing of these traditions with those of the colonial European settlers allowed Louisiana to develop its own unique and vibrant cultural heritage. The traditions of Spain and France were the predominant cultural influences in Louisiana, with Catholicism being the primary religion practiced in New Orleans and the nearby plantations. Slaves from Africa and the West Indies commingled the rituals and beliefs of Catholicism with the cultural traditions of their native lands to create their own practice of voodoo. Voodoo is a complex religion thousands of years old. It's associated with rituals, magic potions, and symbols, or grigri, that can ward off evil spirits, create love potions, heal sickness, and put evil spells on adversaries. In New Orleans, practicing Roman Catholics put pictures of the Virgin Mary on their doorsteps to help ward off the effects of voodoo. In the very heart of New Orleans lies Congo Square. In the 17 and 1800s, it was a gathering place for the slaves and free Creoles, including the infamous Marie Laveau, who led voodoo ceremonies in the square. In the 1830s, the legendary Marie Laveau was the New Orleans queen of voodoo. A Creole, Marie was said to be a racial mixture of Indian, African, and European blood. She was typically called upon to cast spells on lovers or break up marriages. Marie's use of grigri is legendary. Marie also added new tricks to the Caribbean-based practice of voodoo by including Roman Catholic statues of saints, crosses, and incense into the typical ceremonial use of snakes, black cats, and roosters. Music is a vital part of the ritual snake dances of voodoo. Musicians use drums, fiddles, and chants to create hypnotic rhythms to help participants enter a trance-like state. The Caribbean and African-American rhythms of voodoo were a dominant force in the development of the music of New Orleans. If I call on Magnolia, could she break this spell on me? Oh, for the black hope of Mother Dora, I wonder could they set me free, free, free.
The city of New Orleans has always been an inspiration to self-taught artist Charles Gillum. As a child, his interest in painting was fueled by his visits to see the artists of Jackson Square. But Charles has made his mark in the art world through his carvings of the music greats of New Orleans and the Delta. My father used to play blues, and my father used to play uh, the background with Fast Domino. And a lot of music that I listened to, especially Johnny Lee Hooker, remind me so much of my father's music that I had to explore to find out what kind of music this was. And when I went to reading about certain characters, especially Robert John, I wanted to be, I wanted to read more. And I was more inspired at dealing with blues characters. And that's what all I most called was blues characters. I kept carving blues characters and learning about them. So when I'm carving most of my wood carving, my totem poles, Robert Johnson is always my top, top, totem, top man on every totem pole that I ever carved. Robert Johnson is the top man because I always look at him as being the top dog because he was one of the greatest blues players of all time, the one that sold his soul to the devil to be the best guitar player. And I follow that tradition. I, you know, I look at that, I say, well, that's almost something like biblical too, you know. Religious stories provide another favorite subject matter. He carves interpretive depictions of crucifixions, devils, animals, and scenes from the Bible. Charles collects old cypress wood that he finds washed up on the banks of the Mississippi River that sits behind his house to use for his carvings. I taught myself how to carve, and the way I learned, I learned the hard way. They say you're not a wood carver until you get cuts and bruises and bleed. You have to really bleed, you know. And I learned my lesson the hard way of uh, wood carving. Wood carving is something that you really have to focus on. I look at the stuff that I do, especially my wood carvings. To me, it's like a, a spiritual thing. When I look at this piece of wood in front of me, this piece of driftwood, this hundred-year-old piece of cypress wood that had been drifting down the river. And I come and I grab this particular piece up out the river and I look at this piece. I see this piece of wood, but I also see these images inside this wood, these spirits inside this wood. Religion played a, a, a huge part in my life because, like, you know, my family come up, you know, we come up in the church house, really. And church was really a, a basic part of my life. I always had this spiritual you know, this backing, background, that even in my artwork, I always create different images, like I do the Adam and Eve, you know, the Last Supper, I do like on the Lake of Fire. During the late 1940s, New Orleans rhythm and blues took the country by storm. The musicians of New Orleans were front and center as they were called upon to be session players for recordings made in the Crescent City by East and West Coast recording artists. Musicians such as Art Neville, Dave Bartholomew, Earl Palmer, and Fats Domino were soon being heard on the nation's radio airwaves and were listened to by both white and black audiences across the nation. Their music has inspired generations of musicians who are called upon to record and perform the New Orleans rhythm and blues sound. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and Grammy Award winner Alan Toussaint was a major force in the development of New Orleans rhythm and blues. The multi-talented producer, arranger, and songwriter wrote hit after hit for musicians such as Clarence Frogman Henry, Benny Spellman, Lee Dorsey, and Irma Thomas. In the early days of his career, Toussaint studied the styles of famed New Orleans pianists Professor Longhair and Fats Domino. He also credits much of his inspiration from his experiences at the Do Drop In, the legendary 1950s black music club in New Orleans. The Do Drop was the place to be. Everyone who was someone who came through town came to the Do Drop. I mean, when artists came to the Do Drop scene and set, I mean, it was like to kick off your shoes and just be at home. And it was a wonderful time. Irma Thomas, also known as the Soul Queen of New Orleans, is recognized as Louisiana's finest female rhythm and blues vocalist. What I remember about the Dew Drop Inn was fun days. It was my survival spot. It was the place to perform if you were local or even out of town coming through New Orleans. The Dew Drop was the place that you played. You were somebody. You were a recognized performer when you played the Dew Drop. You became the you know, the person to hire when you work the Dewdrop. So it was sort of a stepping stone to a lot of us entertainers in terms of our career moves. Uh, the atmosphere in the Dewdrop was 
another home. It was like your second home. It was the place to hang. Uh, even though it was segregated times, we've had some major stars that stopped in the dewdrop and got over in the corner so they could hear the music. I mean, it was not just an R&B club, it was a music club. He hired jazz musicians as well as blues musicians, as well as uh, Dixieland musicians, R&B blues, you know. It was the place for music. And if you wanted to hear good music, you knew to find your way to the dewdrop. And a lot of the white uh, customers who wanted to be in the dewdrop, they would come in sometime under the guise of a disguise of some kind, but they would make their way into the dewdrop and they had a good time. Ladies and gentlemen, the dewdrop presents Irma Thomas. Irma Thomas, uh, I first saw her at a club called Pimlico, the Pimlico Club. And uh, she was working as a waitress and every chance she'd get, she would just hold our tray on the side and get on the bandstand and sit in and sing, sing songs. Not long afterwards, Irma wound up with Minute Records. That's what started Irma and I as uh, collaborators on making music. When, uh, when this was coming into being, Irma was coming into being. And then looking at Irma, it was easy to decide things like, lines like, you my everything stuff like that. This was not one of the very first, but it was shortly after we decided that we'd be permanent party on the scene. quite different without uh, my having known Irma. Irma inspired so much for his songwriting and the pleasure of a voice. When Irma, when I hear her voice, it does something to my spine. It, it does something really right. When you're alone, the going gets rough. Come back, come back, come back. The New Orleans piano tradition goes back to the early days when blues and jazz were played throughout the streets and in the clubs of the city. Performers such as James Booker, Fats Domino, Professor Longhair, and Alan Toussaint have carried forth this tradition and are recognized as powerful influences in the development of New Orleans rhythm and blues. Fats Domino has sold more than a hundred million records and is considered one of the founders of modern day rock and roll. He was heavily influenced by country, Cajun and blues and his music had crossover appeal to white audiences. The result is a career of hit after hit of chart topping songs, a feat that has never been equaled by any other New Orleans musician. Fats continues to perform and record for thousands of fans around the world. Conversely, Professor Longhair, or Fess, remained in relative obscurity for most of his career. 
However, it's the music of long hair more than any other New Orleans piano player that has come to embody the culturally diverse makeup of New Orleans music. Called the Bach of Rock and Roll by Alan Toussaint, Professor Longhair embraced all the musical elements of New Orleans and then rolled them into a signature style that has never been equaled, only copied. His music is a true gumbo of all the music heard on the streets of New Orleans. Starting with the classic rhythms of New Orleans blues, jazz, and brass bands, Fest then infused the music with a Latin flavor and created many memorable hits, such as his classic Tipitina. The continuing influence that Professor Longhair holes over me uh, is just because at first bite I bit all the way in and uh, and consume as much of Professor Long as I could and would still if he was around putting out new releases however uh, by now I know everything that Professor Long ever recorded and one who cared that much uh, there's no escaping now of course I wouldn't want to but I assume that Professor Long has in everything that I do I mean, I just like the way he played piano. Most of the lyrics, I wasn't even hip to what he was saying. But, the, you know, the biggest splash was made on me when he did Tipitina. Tipitina was, that was, you know, some ma magic stuff, you know. He had been around a long time. There was several different other piano players that they all grew up together. My Uncle Jolly knew Fess. They, they played similar style of piano. But Fess was the one that touched me, touched, I mean, to the max, Tipitina. The Neville brothers also represent the diverse makeup of the cultural traditions and musical styles of New Orleans. Their music has defied record industry labels. It incorporates the musical traditions of Africa, the Caribbean, jazz, blues, gospel, and Native American music. Brothers Art, Aaron, Charles, and Cyril perform music that reflects their cultural history and a legacy that identifies New Orleans as a city that is unmatched in its contribution to the history of popular music. The Neville brothers pay homage to the man affectionately referred to as the patron saint of New Orleans music, Professor Long. Let me see if I can get all the young. Where all the folks from New Orleans at? All the folks from New Orleans, put your hands in the air like that. Come on. See if y'all can get something to put in your hands. Now, y'all know how. We're going to do this for the patron saint of New Orleans music, y'all. Professor Long.
child, I want a dollar. Try to see my name. Louisiana has a slogan. Come as you are, leave different. From the highways, back roads, bayous, and rivers, the sounds of music permeate the very fabric of everyday life. No other state has impacted the development of American music as that of Louisiana. From the nationwide broadcasting of the Louisiana Hayride to the small towns of Acadiana and the motherload of all, the city of New Orleans, the universal love of music has been a cornerstone of Louisiana's cultural heritage and is its gift to the rest of the world. Only here, in the land of jazz, blues, gospel, rhythm and blues, Cajun and Zydeco, could one also throw in a little voodoo to help create the real magic behind those words, les éléments bon temps roulés. <laughs> 